We're, in just a moment, I'm just going to introduce our guest speaker uh, who we've got with us this morning. And then after that, we're going to play a short little video. And then Duncan is going to come up and, and share. Uh, but I just wanted to publicly honor uh, Duncan Banks. We've got Duncan Banks and his wife Debbie with here this morning. Now, for those of you who haven't yet met Duncan or been at one of the services where he's uh, been speaking and been with us, Duncan is the director of the Further Faster Network. The Further Faster Network is the network of churches that we're partnered with. So as a local church, we're not on our own. We're connected to something bigger than ourselves. And the network that we're connected to is called Further Faster. And Duncan is the director, the overseer, the chief, the boss, the king, whatever, you know. So he's the... He's the dream. He, he's the he's the big big picture dreamer guy um, that helps lead the network. And for Beth and I personally, it's been an incredible strength and asset. And for us as a local church, it's been an incredible strength and an asset. Just bef- just at the start of lockdown, we uh, connected together, and it's just been an absolute joy and a delight to do that and to do so. And also, we've had a lot going on in our personal lives at the moment. And, and see, it's not just like this, I, this concept of working in partnership with people is not just an idea, it's a reality. And so Duncan's come along and Duncan's going to be coming and he's speaking next week as well. So if you like it, you can come back next week. If you don't, make up your own mind. But anyway, um, so Duncan is going to speak in next week as well. And then the following week, we've got another guy, Chris from Andover, who's coming up. He's also one of the senior team of Andover, I mean, of Further Faster. So it's just a joy. But my point is this, being in partnership with somebody and working alongside somebody must be more than just an idea. Otherwise, it's just daydreaming, right? But actually working with real people in real life who can come and partner alongside you and support you not only personally, but as a local church, you're seeing that modeled this morning. So I want to honor Duncan for his time, the energy he puts into running an organization, but I want to honor him for his time for coming and serving and being here because he's absolutely passionate about the local church and making it more than just fairy tale ideas, but something that is like flesh, real stuff, working and walking alongside real people through real life. So I'm so blessed and honored to have Duncan and Debbie here this morning. Uh, They're a great asset and a huge friend. Um, It's just a joy. And we're going to play a short video. And then after that video, Duncan's going to come up and and share. But I thought I'd brag on him a bit. So cool. I'm glad he's here today. Thank you, man. Amazing. Morning. Morning. Joel, you call me the king, but no one's bowing. I mean, I'm a little bit... I've been called lots of things before, but never a king. So thank you. It's worth coming just for that. Um, Happy New Year from me. Listen, um, has anybody still got a mixture of kind of gravy and mulled wine and and Gaviscon still running through their veins at the moment? Because it feels like Christmas was a long time ago now. And it feels to me that January is that kind of time of year when we start making a few resolutions, don't we? I've got a bit of advice for you. Honestly, stop making New Year's resolutions. Complete and utter waste of time. What we should be doing is we should be making resolutions for each other. You should be making resolutions for me and I should be making them for you. Because all the time you find people in January who say, do you know what? I'm giving up coffee this year. I've been meaning to do it for years and I've always failed, but this year is the year I'm giving up coffee. It doesn't make me sleep. It makes my heart race. I'm giving up coffee. And you look at that person and you go, no, you need to sort out your anger issues. That should be your New Year's resolution. You should figure out how you deal with your kids better. You know, in fact, you need to keep drinking coffee so you've got enough energy and power to sort those problems out in your life. We should be giving each other New Year's resolutions. But January is the time when we try new things. And the first thing we do is we go to Google or to YouTube and we type those words, how do I? How do I? And so we're starting this four-part series over this month. And we're going to look at the four big questions that people type into Google and type into YouTube this time of year. And we're going to try and give you not some internet answers, but some reliable answers 
answers. Okay, so next week I'm coming back and I'm going to talk about how do I make happy happen. Everybody seems to be chasing the happy life. How do I find happiness? Week three, like Joel says, my friend Chris is coming. He works with me at Further Faster. And Chris is a brilliant communicator and he's coming to talk about how do I become a better person in 2024. We all want to be better than we are or than we were last year. How do I become a better person? And then the final week, David from from, uh, the church here is coming. He's going to talk about how I predict my future. How can I know what path I'm going and what 2024 is going to actually look like? But this week, this week... I'm going to answer the question or help us to find some reliable answers to this question. How do I stay out of trouble? How do I stay out of trouble in 2024? Now, in order for me to answer that question, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about fishing. Anybody here into fishing at all? We got any fisher women or fishermen? No. I'm glad because I don't do it either. I think it's a terrible idea and I think it's bad for the fish. But the thing that I've never understood about fishing, the thing that fascinates me about fishing is how stupid the fish are. Because the fisherman stands on you know, the side of his boat or by the side of a lake, dangles this line and on the end of the line there's a, a juicy worm and a big silver hook. And the fish looks at it and goes, oh that looks tasty, I'll bite that. They fall for it every single time. I mean they never ever sit there and go, hang on a minute. I've seen some of my mates bite that stuff and they get whisked away to a place they don't want to be and we never see them again. In fact, Terry the Turbot, just last week, I saw him get whisked away, shot out of the water, we never saw him again. Fish never think that way. I mean, we, you know, we say that they swim in schools, but they never seem to learn, if you ask me. It seems really crazy. And I just kind of got, it got me wondering, it got me wondering, do you have those kind of habits in your life right now? that get you into trouble, those things that hook you and they seem to whisk you away to a bad place. I mean, what is that secret temptation in your life? That thing that hooks you and whisks you away to a place you don't want to be. And maybe for you it's a little plastic card with the word Visa or MasterCard on it. And you find yourself using it and overspending and getting yourself in trouble and it does your soul harm, let alone your bank account. Maybe for you it's just a little bit of weed or a bit of tobacco And you can't imagine a day without a puff or two. It just kind of gets you through. Maybe for you it's a a prescription drug that's the little temptation or maybe even something stronger. Maybe for you it's a beverage that you can't control and it's getting the better of you and you drink simply to escape life. Maybe for you it's a little bit of online gambling. I mean, it's just an app on your phone. It's not much, but it's ruining your relationships. It's ruining your bank account. And it's ruining your heart. And maybe for you it's just a bad temper that's got you hooked and takes you away to a bad place. And it comes out at work and it comes out with the family. For goodness sake, it even comes out in your relationship with your cat. It's just a thing that you can't seem to shift. Maybe for you it's something sexual and it's just really embarrassing. Maybe that's the thing that's got its hooks into you. Maybe you cut yourself. That's why you wear long trousers and long sleeved shirt so no one else knows about it. Maybe for you your problem is stealing. You nick stuff and you know it's wrong but it just gives you a thrill and it gives you a buzz and you can't seem to stop it. Listen, I want to get really practical with you this morning. I want to talk about in the time that we've got left how you can stay out of trouble, how you can stay away from those things um, this year, how you can stop getting hooked and getting taken away in 2024 to places you really don't want to be. But in order for you to do that, you're going to have to take three steps. Now, you're going to love step one. And when you get to step two, you're going to be taking out your notepad and pen or maybe your phone and jotting them down. You're going to go, oh, I'm really glad I came to church. This is really helpful stuff. When you get to step three, you're going to hate me. Step three, you're going to wish you never came to church. In fact, if you're watching this on YouTube at some other point uh, in the year, you feel free, feel free just to get to the end of step two and then stop. Go watch another YouTube video. In fact, when I get to step three, don't be embarrassed if you want to stand up and walk out. I fully understand because you're going to hate me for step three. You're going to wish Joel never invited me. But let's dive right in. Step one, how do we stay out of trouble in 2024? Step one, we need to redraw the line. We need to redraw the line. You see, what often happens in life is there is a line. A line between what we know is good, let's put that line here, a line between what we know is good and what does us good, and a line that isn't good, and a line that does us harm. There is that line. 
Over this side of the line, it's not a good place to be. Over this side of the line, it hurts our heart, it hurts our soul. Over this side of the line, there might be five minutes of pleasure, but for goodness sake, it, it, it doesn't feel like it's the right place to be. You don't feel the pleasure of anybody else. You don't feel like you're in the right place. You certainly don't feel the pleasure of God. This side of the line, you feel like you're in the right place. You feel like you're calm. This side of the line, you feel like you're in tune with God and everything's well with the world and with your soul. The problem that we have is that we live right up to this line. We look over that side at the five minutes of fun that we could have and we know it's wrong. We know it's a place we shouldn't be. But if we get close, maybe we could sniff it and touch it and smell it and see it. And so we live right up to that line, right on the border of that line, and sometimes we tip over into that line. If you're going to stay out of trouble in 2024, what I'm saying to you is, you need to redraw the line. You need to put the line a long way away from the other line. <sighs> redraw the line in 2024. What does that look like in a human, human being? Well, if it's a credit card problem that's... that's uh, that's, that's bothering you and dragging you away to a place that you shouldn't be. If it's overspending and debt that you keep yourself getting into, don't live right up to the line. Redraw the line. What does that look like in a human being? Well, maybe you need to give your credit card to somebody else. Me and Debbie have done that for so many people. They've got themselves in trouble. They've literally handed their credit cards to us. We've got scissors out and cut credit cards up in front of people. Some people have given us their credit card and said, I'm going to need to phone you every time I need to spend. Maybe your spiritual gift is spending on Amazon. Maybe you're, a gen maybe you're doing it right now. You know, maybe you're a genius at it. And you find yourself in so much trouble because you're living in up to your means and maybe even beyond your means. And it's getting you into so much trouble. Redrawing the line means giving someone else your Amazon password. So that, so that every time you want to buy something, you have to call them and say, look, I need to buy some things. And they'll have a conversation with you. You need to be drastic about this so it doesn't get you into trouble. You know, maybe for you, living up to the line is going out every Friday night with the boys or going out every Friday night or Saturday night with the girls. And you always promise yourself you're just going to have one or two, but it ends up being seven or eight. And you end up drinking things you really shouldn't be drinking, doing things you really shouldn't be doing, getting in between some sheets that you shouldn't be getting in between. Redrawing the line for you might mean not going out Friday and Saturday night with the girls or the fellas. Oh, Duncan, I can feel the pushback already. Duncan, you're just taking all the joy out of life. You're sucking the joy out of life. It's just so restricting what you're suggest suggesting. And bang in the middle of the Bible, there's the Psalms. There's songs that people write about life, honest feelings about life that people have written over the, uh, the centuries to God. Um, Songs that say, God, I hate you, I'm so angry with you. And other songs that say, God, you're fantastic. It's just the honest humanity out written in poetic songs. And the psalmist in Psalm 16 says this, he says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Where I've redrawn the lines, it's not restricting at all. It's actually quite pleasant. When I redraw the line away from there, do you know what? It's a good place to be. Look what he says. He says, surely I have a delightful inheritance. I don't inherit pain and sadness and guilt and shame. I'm inheriting something good that's doing my soul good because I've drawn, redrawn the boundary lines. It's not restricting at all when you redraw the line. It's freeing. It's freeing. Okay, step one. If you want to stay out of trouble in 2024, redraw the line. Step two, recount the cost. Recount the cost. Whenever you're tempted to step over the line, you need to stop to breathe and count the cost of what you're just about to do. Recount the cost of what you're just about to do. And the way you do that is you ask this clarifying question, this one clarifying question. Honestly, if you remember nothing else of the 25 or 30 minutes I'm with you this morning, remember this one phrase, it'll get you out of so much trouble. It's this one question you ask yourself, what if the worst case scenario comes true? What if the worst case scenario comes true? What if I step over the line and the worst case scenario comes true? What if somebody gets pregnant? What if I lose my job? What if I lose my job and therefore lose my home? What if I lose my family? What if I lose my reputation? What if I lose my faith? What do I lose if I step over the line? You recount the cost. You ask yourself, what if the worst case scenario came true? For me, I would lose 
my wife of 32 years of marriage, the most important human being in my world. I'd lose that. If I stepped over the line, I'd lose this beautiful thing that is the most precious thing in my life. I've got three boys. They've grown up, left home now, but they look at me as a man of God and I would lose that reputation with them. I've got two fantastic um, daughters-in-law and they look at me as well as someone who, to look up to and to follow and, and I would lose that reputation with them as well. As Joel says, I, I lead a network of 25 churches. I'm connected with churches in South America, all across the world, in Australia. I've just come back from Australia working with some churches there. I'd lose everything with those churches, all my reputation with all the people I work with. I mean, how many times have you read in the press recently about Christian vicars and ministers and denominational leaders who've stepped over the line and lost everything and it's ruined people's lives? Now listen, I'm not putting myself in the place of a famous Christian because I'm not. You know, I'm a legend in my own cul-de-sac and that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> but you know what it's like? Even the, the minister of the local church, you know, she or he, they step over the line and so much is lost for them and the communities that they lead. Five minutes of fun over the line could wreck a lifetime of pursuing Jesus. You see, when you stop, when you recount the cost, when you ask that question, what if the worst case scenario comes true, you suddenly find that there's always a way out when temptation strikes. There's always an exit sign somewhere. I want to tell you about one guy in the Bible, a guy, a guy called Joseph. I've often said to my wife, hey, darling, I think I'm a lot like Joseph in the Bible. And she says, oh, why are you a lot like Joseph? And then I read her the story and I think you'll probably agree let me read you the first part of Joseph's story Genesis 39 Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man <laughs> what are you laughing at <laughs> and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully who's Potiphar Joseph worked for Potiphar Potiphar was one of the most influential men in the community very wealthy very high-powered man and Joseph worked ran his whole household ran his whole business and it's Potiphar's wife who's looking at Joseph going, oi, oi, he's a bit of all right. Soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything. Is an entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He's held back nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a sin against God. Now, if you'd read Joseph's story, you could have forgiven him if Joseph thought, do you know what? I am going to just dive in. I'm going to go to bed with my boss's wife. She's pretty and it would be fine. It's okay. I'm single. I'm young. I didn't start it. She started it. It's fine. You'd have been forgiven him for thinking that way. I mean, he could have got stuck in and said, you know what? I'm not happy with God. God hasn't helped me out much in life. I wasn't doing anything wrong and I get thrown into a into a pit and then I get sold into slavery. Where was God in that moment? If God's not going to come through for me, if God's not going to do the things that I want him to do, then why should I do the things that he wants me to do? Little kind of sidebar note here. Don't let your disappointments justify your disobedience. Don't let your disappointment with your lot in life justify your disobedience. Don't let your disappointments with people around you, your boss, your family, don't let your disappointments with God himself justify stepping over the line and being disobedient. Because it's a place that you don't want to be dragged to. It's a place you don't want to be. Do exactly what Joseph does in that situation because he recounts the cost. Listen to what Joseph does. She kept, Genesis 39, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. Come on, sleep with me. But he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. I mean, the pressure this fellow was under. But look what he does. Joseph tore himself away but he's le he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When you answer that question, what if the worst case scenario comes true? You look up, there's always an open door you can run out. There's always an exit. There's always a way out. There's always a place to run when temptation comes. So I don't know, maybe for some of us, it's time to redraw the line. Is that you? Red there's some places in your life where you need to draw some more lines because you've been living too close to that line. 
And for some of us, we need to do what Joseph did. We need to recount the cost. And here's my final step. Here's step three. You've loved step one and two. You've taken notes on step one and two. Step three, you might not like. Feel free to wander out at any point. But you're going to say, Duncan, why did you ever come and say that? Here's my final step. Redraw the line, recount the cost, reveal the mess. Reveal the mess. When you mess up, when you cross over that line, tell someone else about it if you want to be healed. Here's what I mean. See, the challenge for you isn't to be forgiven. The challenge for you isn't to confess your sins to God. That's the easy part, confessing your sins to God. He already knows what you've done and he's already forgiven you. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, how does your sin, your stepping over the line, your wrongdoing, how does that leave your body? Through your mouth. If we confess our sin to God, he's faithful, he's just, he'll forgive you of your sins. Forgiveness is not the problem. It's the easy part of this equation. It's easy for you to get on your knees and say, God, I've done it again. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? The challenge for you is to confess your sins. You're crossing over the line to someone else for healing. The challenge for you is to bring that which was in darkness out into the light. I told you you were going to hate me for this. It's tough. But listen to the wisdom of Jesus' brother, James. He says this in James chapter 5. He says, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other. The result? So that you may be healed. I mean, how many times have you been on your knees saying, God, I'm so sorry, I'm here again. Will you forgive me for crossing the line? And God forgives us and we feel better for five minutes and then five minutes later we're right back at it. And you don't seem to get past it. You're like that little fish that gets dragged out time and time again to a place you don't want to be. How do you get free of that? How do you get healed from that? It's revealing the mess. It's confessing your sins to others, praying for each other so that you may be healed. Do you see, you confess your sins to God for forgiveness, you confess your sins to others for healing. Let me be honest with you. I'm going to run the risk here of upsetting some of you. Some of you will dislike me for what I'm about to say and you'll ask Joel never to invite me again. But I'm saying it because... I want you to live free in 2024. I want you to stay out of trouble in 2024. I don't want you to be hooked and dragged to a place you don't want to be in 2024. I don't want you to lose your reputation, your family, your job, your income, your home in 2024. So can I humbly suggest that some of you need to quit drinking? Some of you need to quit drinking. You've got a drinking problem. You can't handle it. How do you know you've got a drinking problem? Somebody's mentioned it in the past month. That's how you know you've got a, dr a drinking problem. And you might say, Duncan, I'm not addicted. Yes, I'll have a jar now and again, a snifter, a restorative, but it's not a problem. Okay, well, stop drinking for 30 days. Give it a break for a month. Prove to yourself that you're not addicted. You need to run the risk of confessing this to someone else, revealing the mess to someone else. Otherwise, you're going to be just right back where you started. Some of you need to quit eating quite so much. You're struggling with self-control when it comes to food. You're way out of control and it's affecting your health. I read this report on the BBC website recently. Health professionals are saying that obesity-related deaths are now beginning to top um, alcohol-related deaths. We're eating too much as a nation. You've got a difficult next step if that's you. And, and as I'm saying it, some of you are saying, no, that's not me. Others of you are saying, it's exactly where I'm at right now. You've got a difficult next step. Just saying sorry to God is not enough. You'll be forgiven, but it's not enough. You need to reveal the mess. You need to confess it to someone else. Some of you need to stop having sex with someone who isn't your spouse, someone you're not married to. Some of you need to stop having sex with someone you're not married to. Some of you are either having an affair or flirting with the idea of having an affair if that's you i have three words for you stop it now stop it now you can do it stop it now and you might be saying to, to say, say to me look it's, it's just a little flirtatious relationship with someone in the office it's just a little flirtatious relationship with a facebook friend i'm just on this app for a bit of fun it's fine nothing's going to happen some of you need to stop 
stop it now before it gets to a place you don't want it to be and everything gets ruined. And the only way you're going to do that is not just getting on your knees and asking God to forgive you. That's the easy part. You're going to need to reveal the mess to someone else if you want to find some healing from that. Some of you, some of you need to um, forgive someone who's really hurt you. God, that's hard, isn't it? If you want to stay out of trouble in 2024, you're going to have to forgive someone who's really hurt you. You know, there's a, a time when Jesus was praying and his disciples looked at him and said, hey, Jesus, show us how you do that. You know, you, you have this connection with God that is so beautiful and so special and we don't have that. God feels distant, yet for you it feels like you're really close to him. How do you pray? How do you do that? And it's almost as if Jesus says, I'm glad you asked me that, fellas. And he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. And halfway down through the Lord's Prayer, there's this one line where Jesus says, when you pray, you should say, forgive us our sins as. Forgive us our stepping over the line as we forgive everyone who sins against us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us. There's an old theologian called Charles Williams. He said this, no word in English carries a greater possibility of terror than that little word as in that clause. You know, there's a scholar called Walter Wink and he writes about a time after the Second World War when um, uh, these two peacemakers wanted to, they, they visited some Polish Christians and they wanted to bring Polish Christians and German Christians together. Um, and so they visited the Polish Christians and they said, said to these Polish Christians, listen, we have some German brothers and they would love to meet with you and they would love to ask your forgiveness for what Germany did during the war. <clears throat> they want to begin a new relationship with you. I know it was horrendous. I know what Germany did to Polish people during the war was awful, but would you meet with them? And, and they just want forgiveness and restoration. They want to start a new relationship. Would you meet with them? These two peacemakers were shocked because the Polish Christians just stood in silence with tears in their eyes. And eventually one of them spoke. And he said this, he said, what you're asking is impossible. Every stone of Warsaw is soaked with Polish blood that they spilt. We cannot forgive. And so they talked a little bit longer and these two peacemakers said, fine, we've tried. Shall we just close by saying the Lord's Prayer together? And they all held hands, our Father art in heaven, hallowed be your name. They get down to this line, they're all saying it together. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others who sin against us. Forgive us our sins. They just couldn't stay, say it. There was silence in the room. Eventually one of the Polish Christians spoke and said, I can no longer say this prayer or call myself a Christian if I don't forgive. Humanly speaking, he said, I can't do it. But God will give us the strength. And 18 months later, they met with these German Christians and they began a relationship, a restoring relationship that lasted a lifetime. Now I know forgiving someone who's hurt you is a really difficult and complex process. It's a process that might take days or weeks or months or even years and you need to understand I have been there it's a painful thing to go through and I can feel some of you saying it's fine for you to say that preacher man but you don't know what's happened to me you don't know how much they've hurt me no I don't know but I know what they did to Jesus they hung him on a cross for something that he didn't do so if you think you're better than Jesus you've got to pass on that one but if not if not you're going to need to confess your sin of unforgiveness and start forgiving them. And the only way you're going to do that is to reveal the mess. To get other people involved. To confess to other people where you're at. And to ask them to pray with you. Some of you, finally. Some of you married couples. You need to ask for help. Because your marriage is sinking fast. I can't ask for help. If I start telling people my marriage is in trouble. They'll know that my marriage is in trouble. They listen, when you get separated or you get divorced, people will know your marriage is in trouble. And some of you need, need to find the time early this year to sit down and involve someone else, confess to someone else, we're sinking, we need some help. 
Listen, these steps I'm suggesting you make are not easy steps. It's going to take courage. It's going to take bravery. But they are the right steps for you to take. So what I'm asking you to do at the start of 24 is to be brave, is to make a brave move. And I don't say any of these things to condemn anyone. I've struggled with lots of them myself. And you know what? I know this about this place because I've been here before and I know Joel and Beth really well. This is the kind of community, this is the kind of church where it's all right not to be all right. It's okay not to be okay here. You need to get in that place where you can confess to other people. So, being practical, what are you going to do next? Straight after this talk, because I'm going to finish in a few minutes, we'll have coffee, chat. What are you going to do? Go home. Nice service today. Lovely to be back with everybody. Or are you going to do something about what you've just heard? What are you going to do? What's your breath, brave, courageous next move? Are there some lines that need redrawing for you? Some of you are sitting there going, yeah, there is. There's some financial, relational lines that need redrawing here. Vocational lines that need redrawing. Are there some costs that need recounting? Because you got too close to this line and you stopped counting the cost. Maybe you need to count that cost. Some of you, some of you, there is is some, some mess that needs revealing. It's okay not to be okay here. It's all right not to be all right. Is there a bit of mess that needs revealing you're going to need some courage if you're going to stay out of trouble in 2024 you know the other thing i found out about fishing which surprised me is fishermen do this thing called catch and release so they'll dangle their rod their line into a into a lake or into the sea and they'll catch a fish and they'll take it out and they'll look at the fish they'll take a picture with the fish and then they throw it back in and I've often wondered, what goes through the mind of a little fish at that moment? And he thinks, oh no, I've been caught. I've seen other people do it. Why am I so stupid? Why do I take the bait? Why do I bite the hook? Now it's my turn. And he's whisked away to a place he doesn't want to be. And he's out there and he's getting a selfie with a fisherman. And then all of a sudden, plop, he's back into the water. And have you seen the fish when you put it back into the water? They go mad. Their little tails go and they swim off like crazy. And they must be swimming off going, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Listen, do you want to be free like that? Or do you want to live over the line in trouble in 2024? Because if you want to be free, redraw some lines, recount some costs. And reveal the mess and you will know what it is to be free. I want to pray. We've got a couple of minutes. I want to pray for you. So let's just close our eyes and pause here for a moment. If God's been speaking to you this morning and you know there's something you need to do with what you just heard, if there are some lines need redrawing, some mess needs revealing, some cost needs recounting, if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. No one's, everyone's eyes are closed. Raise your hand and then I'm going to pray for you. Go ahead, do that now. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Father. It's good, you know, when you do that. Okay, hands down, thanks. It's good when you do that. It's good when you raise your hand. You're saying in front of everybody and in front of the Holy Spirit, I'm in business here. Father, for the dozen or so people who've raised a hand, for the others who wanted to but didn't, feel like maybe they had the courage to do so I want to pray that this won't just become another start of the year talk in church but it'll be life changing that will keep us from getting hooked and dragged to a place we don't want to be I pray for my sisters and I pray for my brothers who've got some courageous brave next steps to make I pray that you give them the courage to take those steps I want to thank you for New Life Church for this being the kind of place where it's alright not to be alright It's okay to reveal the mess. Nobody points fingers and laughs or judges because we're all in the same boat. I want to pray, Father, that you would heal broken people in this community as they start revealing what's going on in their lives. As they start confessing, as James says, their sins to one another and praying for one another, that healing would just rifle through this community. And Father, thank you for those people who've been brave enough to raise a hand. Honour them. Honour them today by filling them right now again with the power of your Holy Spirit. 
pray these beautiful things in Jesus' name. Everybody agreed and said? Amen. 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 Joel, my friend. Hey, see you next week, huh? Yeah. Are you coming back? I'm not sure. Yeah. Ready to go to five? No, just kidding. Oh, anyway. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, one thing we do, definitely just to reaffirm that, it's okay to not be okay, 100%. Uh, we've got a lot of amazing, wonderful people, a lot of safe places, and um, uh, if you're scared about anything, um, there's this verse that says, love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear, and we don't want anyone to feel scared. We want anyone to feel cared for. Um, if we can do anything to help, we're here to help. We've also got some time now, so at 12 o'clock, we'll need to go collect all your amazing kiddos. Um, they're not going to like it to be left for a week, so um, please, please remember to collect them. Um, but yeah, we've got some time now. If you want to grab another drink, have a, um, a coffee or tea, I'll specify that after that message, right? <laughs> grab a hot drink. Um, no, if you want to grab another tea or coffee, hang out. we got some time. We can hang out with one another. If we haven't met yet, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to um, have a chat. And if you have to go, hey... Have a great week. Have an amazing week. Whatever you've got going on, if you need to just um, get and go, we're finished now. We'll be back next Sunday. But if you've got to go, be blessed. Have an amazing time. It's really awesome to be together. So thank you. Mm-hmm.